So it's, it's my pleasure to um, um, introduce the next topic. We're going to be doing a panel discussion on clinical trials and outcomes. This is a hybrid panel. Um, we have uh, Dr. Melanie Brandeboer, who, who's joining us online. Melanie couldn't be here in person today, but she is uh, joining us online. And in person here today, um, we have um, Dr. Shulse, Dr. Andrews and Dr. Curie, can I please invite you up to the stage? A little bit about our panelists in the meantime. Um, so Dr. Brandeburg is currently a senior medical director in global clinical development at Ultragenics, where she works on the development of therapeutic agents for neurodevelopmental rare diseases. Um, she um, has a degree in uh, clinical neurology. She has expertise in working on, um, uh, working on Parkinson's disease and several other movement disorders. Um, Dr. Brandeburg is also involved with, our, uh, with the CTD program at Ultragenics, and she, um, um, she will be participating in the clinical panel. Um, this, the goal of this panel, just to set the stage for everyone in the audience, is to leave with a better understanding of what a clinical trial is, what are outcomes, why are they important in a trial, and what are the roles and responsibilities of families that are looking to enroll in such a trial. Um, moving on with the introductions, um, Dr. Shulze um, is affiliated with the Hospital of si for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. He has his own research group uh, with a focus on cerebral creatine deficiency syndromes. He's also the director of the newborn screening program at the Hospital for Sick Children. Um, and we heard earlier today from um, Alex Lee, um, um, candidate in his lab. Next, we have um, Dr. Sadet Andrews. Um, Dr. Andrews is an exper uh, expert also on um, rare, disorder, rare disorders uh, of genetic origin. Um, she has worked on creatine deficiency disorders, paradoxin dependent epilepsy and epilepsy genetics in general. Um, and bringing up the last member of our panel, we have Dr. Curie. Um, Dr. Curie is a neurologist at the Child Neurology Department of Lyon Hospital in France. Um, she works closely with Extraordinaire. She has expertise in specifically in X-linked intellectual um, disorders. Um, she also has expertise in new outcome measures that are uh, adapted for intellectual disability patients. Um, before we start, I think it would be useful if we just went through the panelists and just heard a little bit about their thoughts on clinical trials for CCDS. Uh, just overarching. Um, maybe thoughts and themes to kickstart the discussion. So um, can I call upon uh, maybe first uh, Dr. Brandeburg since she is joining us remotely, and then we'll go through our panelists on stage. Thank you, Sangeetha. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. I'm so sorry I can't be there in person and so pleased to have been invited to participate in this important conference. Um, as you know, uh, Ultragenics is working in the CTD space we're very excited about our program. I can't speak to any specifics about that program. So I'm going to just kind of speak generally about clinical trials and just to acknowledge that the challenge of finding um, the right endpoints cannot be overstated. And I know this is something that's, that ACD is very well aware of and many of the people in this room have worked on extensively. Um, but just to, to point out that we not only have to find measures that show us, um, that, that track and show hopefully improvements in clinical trials in this population. We also have to do that in a relatively short period of time in the space of a clinical trial, because you can't, you can't pick something that's gonna be the hardest thing to change and just run a trial for five years until you may or may not see any improvement. And then in addition, we have to, as a pharmaceutical company, we have to take our ideas and your ideas too about what, what measurements are important and convince the agencies that this will help us demonstrate meaningful results in a clinical trial. So to me, that's one of the biggest challenges. Thank you, Dr. Brandeburg. Dr. Schulze. Uh, um, 
So thinking about this uh, problem, how to um, go, uh, what to plan and what to do in with clinical trials, especially in, in the field of creatine deficiency disorders, is uh, it's a very challenging issue. And um, if I think about creatine transporter deficiency specifically, I think we agree that this is a neurodevelopmental disorder that is not fast progressing. So the pattern mechanism we have not discussed about this much, and of course not, not so much is known, but I would say most of it um, is related with the differentiation of the growing brain. If there is a deficiency in creatine uh, delivery, the, the brain does not differentiate properly. But this is a process that ends uh, at around four, five, six years. So the question is, if you find a cure for this condition, can you demonstrate this in the clinical trial in a 20-year-old young man with creatine transporter deficiency? What are you expecting to see? That is a very important question that one has to think about. and. Um, especially when it comes to, and Ethereum mentioned this uh, very impressively today, you know, some of those trials, they are uh, in order to convince the regulator to approve a medication. And we have had just recently uh, in this field kind of disappointment with a trial that works quite well, but doesn't meet all of the endpoints, and the regulator is not happy. We could have predicted this before designing the trial, but it was not done. So when we think about clinical trials for in this field, one of the things that is extremely important is really to think about those outcomes. And this brings me to the other question. Uh, it is now much more recognized that the patient-oriented outcomes are extremely important. So Carol, um, nicely demonstrated what is most important for the families. And when I look at the number one, two, and three, so uh, for transporter patients, communication, uh, comprehension, learning uh, uh, capacity, social interaction, behavior. I would predict, even with a cure in an adult with creatine transporter deficiency, you may not necessarily see this you may even see the opposite. I have had this um, observation in one of my patients, always when we did an intervention, his um, compulsive, aggressive behavior worsened instead of getting better. It could make sense because now the brain is not well organized in the first place, and now you provide the brain with a bit better energy. Are you expecting that now everything works well? No, it could be the opposite. I'm just saying, you know, I don't want to be negative <laughs> here, but um, studies testing uh, new treatments should include all of that as endpoints. But when it comes to clinical studies that are necessary to convince the regulator for approval of new treatments, one has to be very, very uh, conscious about what to add. Thank you, Dr. Schulze, Dr. Andrews. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks very much for inviting me. Um, now, the difficulties what we have, we have been hearing since morning. Um, first of all, we don't have the good therapy at the moment. Um, also, we don't have a very extensive natural history studies of the disease. That's why um, the current uh, activities the ACD has been doing, just developing the patient-oriented uh, databases and registries, this is really, really great point to start. Um, and of course, uh, it's not only a one-side effort, uh, it, it is combination of uh, patients, uh, families, as well as physicians. But also, the uh, health regulatory agencies just bringing them into the picture 
very early that they can uh, provide uh, some uh, information, some support to finally the therapy that we found and then we started with clinical trials, they will have to approve at the end. If there are no approvals, there is no way we can bring this therapy from bench to uh, bedside. Uh, yes, at the clinical trial uh, level, yes, we do that. But after the clinical trial are completed, uh, it's very, very difficult. That's why maybe the health uh, regulatory agencies, uh, people need to be on the table from early uh, uh, interventions and then uh, meetings that they can provide their uh, site uh, as well. The other uh, thing is we have known these disorders maybe for more than 20 years. What we are currently uh, focusing on uh, currently available biomarkers. What we have uh, MR spectroscopy, creatine levels, and urine or plasma levels, but we will really need to think out of the box because maybe those novel therapies that we will find will not affect those biomarkers. And we really need easily, readily available biomarkers, uh, development of those biomarkers, uh, that we can monitor uh, outcomes using those biomarkers. That's why uh, actually the scientists uh, need your help. Uh, uh, how we uh, started the symposium, uh, the, it can be fibroblasts, uh, blood samples, urine samples. If CSF collected CSF samples to just uh, have a biobanking system in place that we can identify different novel biomarkers help us to assess the outcomes because sometimes using neuropsychological assessments uh, or uh, currently available clinical biomarkers will or may not help us uh, to assess the outcomes. Thank you so much for inviting me here. I'm very glad to be with you. Uh, I think that uh, my first thought is that it can be a very good occasion of a nice collaboration between families and doctors uh, and researchers, more generally speaking, um, because I think that it's my experience as a clinician. I think that all of you who have a, a child who has a, a creatine disorder, and it's true for a lot of very rare disease, I think that you are developing a very special expertise. And we as clinicians have to recognize that because you know your child as no one else know, knows the, the, your child. So I think it's important that we can collaborate to define what matters. And uh, uh, Carol Stoke was a, a wonderful um, example of uh, the clinical symptoms that can be really meaningful for the families. And we have to take that into account, of course. I think that what matters is that we keep in mind that within the clinical trial setting, we need to have um, like methodology that will give us the opportunity to be sure that what we observe is not related to placebo effect, but really to the treatment that we are um, uh, trying to, to see if it works or not. Um, so objective outcome measures are really necessary. And um, I think that it's very important that we can test for what really uh, is impaired in, in, in our patients because uh, usually we, I mean, I totally agree that uh, intermediary uh, outcome measure can be very uh, uh, interesting such as, as you mentioned, uh, uh, urinary or blood test or whatever, but <clears throat> I think that uh, what matters also is to have a, um, a way to measure how the person can reason, the, the reasoning abilities, and if it can improve, uh, the learning abilities are really uh, important to improve. And I think that within um, some set, uh, setting, we can we can test for that. Um, the the mention that what Dr. Schulz uh, mentioned about the age. I think it's a tricky question. I don't know if we will have time to come back to that. My experience with fragile X syndrome, um, I've been uh, intensely involved in the trials with this disorder. And it's true that um, among all the international experts on fragile X syndrome, not all of us were totally on the same page um, towards uh, should we or not try to treat fragile X patients as early as neonates. Whereas we do not, we are not sure, and we have not demonstrated yet that the treatment will work, um, and we have not 
we are not sure what can be the side effect at this age. This is, this is a tricky question. So I think that by collaborating and, and um, having a good network and, and, and listen to each other, we can improve the, the way we can uh, design uh, clinical trials. Thank you so much, Dr. Curie. Um, I don't, oh, perfect. The hand raised, so. I have a question about what uh, you said, Dr. Jules. Uh, so you mentioned that if we'd find a treatment that uh, the patient might get worse um, in the start or in general, do you think that it might need like a treatment or a patient might need some time of adaptation before getting used to the treatment? Like I think that's also what's seen in medication for depression. Like it needs like minus six weeks before the treatment actually works and before that patient gets worse. Yes, um, what, I, <coughs> what I did, by the way, with, with our patient, and we, we just treated with, with precursors, but it, did, it made, did make a difference in, in his behavior. I encouraged the family to continue, because after some time of adjustment, it may provide the brain with, with more ability to uh, adapt and, uh, and perform. So, yeah, most likely, uh, I, I would expect that it still has a benefit. Uh, and when I said this, it, it was more um, planning those studies. The question really is, if you do this in an, uh, in an infant uh, group, where you basically treat preventively, you may be able to demonstrate a cure basically the disappear, not appearance of, uh, of symptoms, but you may not expect this for someone who is much older. Um, but does not mean that it is not beneficial for someone who is older. This question is also for you, Dr. Schulze. Um, when you were talking about the patient meaningful outcomes and the example that Carol gave um, in taking into consideration what us as families, find important as outcomes, and in giving pause to what actually might throw red flags for the regulatory um, mm -hmm. bodies that might be approving that or upsetting them because you get the opposite effects. Mm -hmm. So my question to you would be, how would we navigate that as families when we're participating in giving those suggestions and stuff? Um, and do they allow for some kind of an overlap for when you provide a treatment, you're going to see a strength of an outcome that you prefer. But as you mentioned, you might also see some regression or exacerbations of others. Do they take into account that when you wake a cognitive ability up, it will awaken the senses of others that need to be trained or as she just mentioned, given some time to work through? Or do they just say, oh wow, that's just too compound and we don't wanna go there? So <clears throat> the regulators do not look much as far as I know on uh, other clinical studies. They just look for the results of this specific uh, trial, right? So those clinical trials, they have three different uh, phases. Phase one is safety, phase two is um, efficacy to some degree, and phase three is basically to prove the benefit of the treatment. And this is what the regulator then uses to say yes or no. But uh, we as a group, you as the families, you are us participating in way more clinical studies. Everything that comes up needs to be investigated. And I think one uh, very important aspect is to have core outcome sets for all of those studies that are the same. So this is a new development to figure out by asking the families as one part and asking the physicians at the other side, what do they consider as the most important outcomes? And then this is used to f define, let's say, two, three core outcomes that should be part of every clinical study in the future. Because if you do that, you have a little, you have at least a few things that you can compare. Currently, it is not this way, so every study does something else, and at the end of the day, you have tons of data, but you cannot really uh, combine them. So, but you don't have to be worried. 
about that. So this was not a warning to, <laughs> to the families not to participate in, uh, in anything that could kind of put an, uh, a new drug at harm. No, no, that's not. But if it comes to the regulatory study, that this is you, most of the time industry um, initiated clinical trial, I think then it becomes important. Um, what's the biggest concern of picking the wrong clinical outcome and what are you guys doing to mitigate the risk? And I, I, this question is for Melanie. I had a feeling I'd get this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there are a lot of risks. Um, one risk is that we might have a drug that is effective and, and all of us know about many studies like this, right? So we, we have a drug that we believe to be effective and the clinicians believe to be effective, but we have not demonstrated efficacy in the, um, the way our trial was set up. Like we maybe chose the wrong primary endpoint or we didn't have strong secondary endpoints that could have backed up a failed primary endpoint. So I, to me, that's the biggest risk. And that's why we do so much work beforehand to try to um, choose our endpoints carefully. Just a comment, um, because I'm not sure that it is clear for everybody, primary outcome measure, primary endpoint, is the one that you choose before, and only if the, the study demonstrates an effect on this, you can conclude that the, the study is positive. If you pick the wrong one, you will have to say that the study is negative, even if you have at, as, uh, as secondary outcome measures interesting measurement, but um, you cannot say that the, the, the clinical trial would be uh, positive if your primary outcome is not uh, effective. Thank you so much, Aurora. For, I just wanted to add to that some of the work we're doing um, with the Vigilance study, which I think you're all aware of, is to try to choose outcome measures that will work in this particular population because you have to choose outcome measures that will, that will apply to a population. If you have something where the patients aren't able to score anything or everybody's kind of above the ceiling for that outcome measure, you won't be able to use it consistently in this, this population. So for those of you who have participated in Vigilant as investigators and as families, um, we're really, really grateful because we think that information will be very useful in terms of clinical trial design going forward. Um. Oh, you're, I think I'll hand this off to you right after me. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so, a couple dumb questions. One is, are you all already collecting all your natural history in one database, or are you collecting it in many databases? Can you answer? I got follow-ups. I can say something about that, maybe. So for uh, Vigilant was one of the natural history studies that is being um, collected uh, for CTD. Um, that data set is being managed by Ultragenics and their collaborators. Um, on our end, which is the ACD, we, we have a registry initiated effort um, that captures certain metrics. So we have a natural, a version of natural history study being done to, through that for both CTD and GAMT. Um, to the best of my knowledge, apart from those, I don't believe we have, uh, we, we may have some in, in France, Europe, yes. in France, um, but uh, apart from those efforts, um, uh, we don't know of any other, and um, at this time, those are three distinct sources of information. And is there a possibility that those can be combined in the very near future? We're definitely working on it. I don't mean to put anyone on the spot, but uh, but I, I, we've had ongoing discussions about it, um, and um, you know, there's there's a timeline for for publications for for some of these. Um, uh, I know that um, Ultragenics has definitely committed to um, publishing their data set when they've completed all of their analysis, um, and so are we. Um, the edict, so to speak, of our own registry is to make sure that the data is out there um, as it is obtained and ready for. Okay, one more. Um, have you all done conceptual models of disease for each of the three disorders? I mean, those are the um, kind of like what the lady from France was talking about, which was a survey-based study, but a true conceptual model is an anthropological interview-based study that the FDA really, really prefers. And if you have that, then that is your basis for proving what really matters to patients. 
and what you can ask all your questions about. Have you all already done all that? Uh, maybe, Melanie, would you like to take uh, an aspect of that question and I can add what we're doing as well? Yeah, I would love to take an aspect of that question. We are in the process of developing uh, a conceptual model for CTD. And so um, it's something we're working on. We are at present lining up interviews with clinicians and then interviews with families um, to, to gain exactly the information that you were talking about to build a conceptual model which will also include a literature review and other things. Again, it's all in the interest of trying to find the best outcome measures we can um, when, we, when we hopefully are able to go into the clinic. And on our part, the ACD has um, initiated, sorry, I'm at the back of the room now, um, but we've initiated um, efforts through a recently obtained PCORI grant um, so we're following uh, similar methodologies in terms of um, uh, conversations with families, um, integrating the insights from families along with those from physicians to inform a core outcome set. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next question. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Dr. Andrews. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, biomarkers. Um, and um, also about biobanking system. Are there any studies on going to identify biomark biomarkers and do they need to be validated to be, to be able to, uh, to be used in the clinical trials? I think Sankita is gonna answer this question as well. <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's something that we've, uh, we've thought a lot about and we, we're working with experts in the, in the field. So we have some uh, efforts underway, uh, both along the, um, uh, something along the lines of newborn screening, uh, because we don't have this for CTD. Um, so trying to develop some methods that can help us uh, uh, diagnose at birth and probably follow um, along the way, along disease development. Uh, but they're very much in early stages. We're definitely looking for more insights from experts in this area. I think the biomarker studies are really important because we can use metabolomics and pro proteomics approaches. However, at the university hospitals, we haven't looked into it, and biobanking is quite uh, difficult and requires a large amount of funding uh, uh, and uh, multi-center collaborations, uh, which the protocols are approved in different centers and sample collections started. Uh, it's a huge effort. Uh, that's why, yes, we need to start uh, as a scientific uh, community, uh, but we haven't started yet. D Dr. Schultz, you meant can I briefly uh, just say something to the biomarkers? <laughs> um, the, the one problem we are facing, and you are aware about this, is we are, sp we are speaking about the brain. And uh, peripheral biomarkers, that's unfortunately uh, is a huge limitation. So what peripheral biomarker can you use to assess the change of metabolism in the brain? There is not much especially non-invasive. So MR spectroscopy is the best we have right now, where we can quantify the amount of creatine in the brain. Uh, but it's, I, I would say it's not, it's not great. It is perhaps good to demonstrate that there is an effect of a treatment, but that's all. But there might be other uh, activities, and I, I asked, uh, um, Thomas from um, uh, Sarah's brain, whether I'm allowed to talk about this. So, I mean, we talk about brain uh, creatine metabolism, and this is associated to brain energy metabolism. There are other metho methods to assess brain energy metabolism, and uh, one of them is FDG PET scanning, where you can measure the activity of glucose uh, metabolism. And it, it looks like that this is perhaps a method where you, we can demonstrate that a patient with a creatine transporter defect, for example, has an alteration in brain creatine metabol in, in brain energy metabolism. So, and then having a treatment and demonstrating that the energy metabolism in the brain changes, this would, in my opinion, be a pretty good biomarker that I could see uh, that uh, a regulator like FDA would agree 
on. So the research for biomarkers is, is, uh, is very important and um, yeah, any new idea uh, is, is, uh, is welcome. Yeah, if I could add to that, I think there, I think this field of biomarkers is very, is not very well established, but it's kind of blowing up around us right now. There are all sorts of ideas for, for getting like plasmids that come from, um, that are brain derived, that you can measure in the plasma there. I mean, there are all kinds of things. They're just not proven. And at this point, even if you got one that looked really promising, the regulatory agencies would tell you it was an exploratory endpoint, which at this point is appropriate. Meaning it, it's, you couldn't get a drug approved just because your little biomarker looks good at this point. Down here to your right, uh, it's questions for anybody on the panel, but uh, Dr. Scholz kind of brought up industry initiated clinical trials. Can you speak to the alternatives besides industry initiated clinical trials? And is there a preference um, for regulators Um, I, I don't know the second question, I don't know um, whether there is a preference, but perhaps someone else knows. But um, there are certainly some uh, clinical centers in, in the US, for example, also in Canada, that do uh, investigator-initiated clinical trials. But this is an, uh, it's, it's a one-in-a-lifetime event. If you do this, you have to put all your resources into this is it's huge every company pharmaceutical company that uh, does a clinical trial knows how much this is millions of dollars and it's a it needs a lot of uh, um, resources people organization so it's it's not so much you know uh, you have a good idea you have a candidate now let's test this in patients and then uh, this is kind of what we did over the last 30, 40 years somehow, but it doesn't work. If an institution really wants to uh, decide or an investigator decides to do this, that's great. But it is rather the exemption, not the rule. Dr. Andrews, yeah, I was gonna yeah. just say if you could add some more color to that based on your experience. Yeah, the, the, the issue is when you do a researcher, initiated clinical trials. The funding can come from industry. Clinical trial is independent uh, of the industry, uh, but still the results will not change how the drug is approved, how the results are interpreted. Because most of the time, or 100% of the time, even the industry is developing a clinical trial, the uh, physicians uh, or researchers are involved in those uh, developments. That's why uh, I don't see any problem with that. However, when you have an uh, the uh, researcher initiated clinical trial, you cannot do multicenter clinical trial because of the funding, which you are located in one center only, uh, and the cr trial cannot be opened to many people. And it's more disadvantage unless uh, you have a, a, a very extensive uh, funding support from the industry. Thanks. So um, in response to Dr. Schulz's point about the high stakes here, and hearing from the families really kind of sparked this question in, in my mind. There is a disease burden in, in female patients with CTD. Do you include female patients in the first clinical trials, or do you depend on peripheral blood lionization or, or as a hope for prediction of CNS? Is it, how do you, how do you sort of uh, balance those two needs? I can um, give an example for a different X-linked metabolic disease, and this is OTC deficiency. It, it's, it's very frequent, and uh, there are clinical trials where females are enrolled, even primarily because there are many more. So you don't have many uh, a male OTC, you have plenty of <laughs> female OTC. So yes, if you have a good uh, yeah, it's possible. 
This question is for uh, Dr. Curie, and um, after that, maybe I'll go for a comment from uh, Dr. Brandeburg as well. So um, when you look at outcomes uh, associated with intellectual disabilities, can you elaborate on what that might look like in the context of a clinical trial? So what is measured, um, and how? Um, what's the time course of measurements, so on and forth? And I, I think I would love for Melanie to weigh in on the same aspect. So I think that it's something very important. Thank you for this question. It's the timeline. So how long should we um, treat? I mean, how, how should we organize the, the clinical trial in order to be sure to see an effect? And of course, it will depend on the drug that you will test, because um, I assume that all the effects will not be the same with the same timeline. So of course, it will depend on, on the treatment that you are trying to, to look at. Um, then I think that it also depends on the type of trial that you will use. Um, generally speaking, uh, you use uh, what we call randomized clinical trial, which means that you have a group of patients who received placebo and you have a group of patients who received the treatment that you would like to test. Um, so it's very, it's, it's common good clinical practice. Um, but there are also other type of, tr of, uh, of trials, which are called um, single case experimental designs, which allow us to include less, uh, um, s only a few patients, let's say five instead of a lot. <laughs> uh, and to see uh, what is interesting is this idea to use the same outcome measure because there is a way using uh, Bayesian statisticians, statistics that you can combine several, for example, several uh, SCAD uh, clinical trials and you can see if on a kind of a small group of patients, you can reproduce that before going to a very large trials. Because as you mentioned, I mean, it's of course very expensive to have large trials, including several, several hundreds of patients, um, especially in rare disease. So SCED uh, clinical trial can be a good first step to see if it looks like um, that uh, it works, it can work. Thank you. Melanie? Well, <laughs> Dr. Curie just brought up a lot of very, very good points, and uh, it's kind of hard to focus this discussion, but I think basically um, you, your first clinical trial in humans has to really be for safety, and then you are hoping to get a little bit of proof of concept information from that first study, and in terms of using the smallest number of patients, you have to use enough patients that you're convinced that you have good safety data um, at, at the end of that at the end of that study. And then for the other thing that you have to do is you're gonna to have to show that your measurements that you've chosen are going to be, are going to tell you what you need to know. So that is usually done in a phase two study where you say, okay, these are, these are the measurements we've chosen. We've chosen them from speaking to multiple physician experts in this disease. We've chosen them from talking to families. We've chosen them from these natural history studies, but we still need to show that they will that they will demonstrate whether this drug is working or not. And so if we did that, if we jumped right into a really big study with the wrong instruments, then we could have a failed study, as I mentioned before. So what we'd ideally like to see is that we, in our, we have some evidence of proof of concept in our first safety study, and that, that the instruments we take into our phase two study are robust and are showing us um, whether we're seeing an improvement or not. So, um, and then, then we can go forward with a big expensive phase three study with um, the instruments that we've chosen that demonstrate um, whether there's a benefit or not. Because keep in mind that since there isn't an effective treatment for CTD, we, we don't know if these instruments that we get from the natural history studies are going to show us whether a drug is working or not, so. Just to tag along, and this is really for anybody here, but um, we're, we're talking about the size of the study and we don't have very many patients to begin with. Um, so kind of a two part is what's the difficulty of, sorry, what's the difficulty of, of getting the people for the study, but also if we have multiple trials for different drugs, we're talking about different you know, concepts here, um, how does that affect us? You know, can you, can you be part of mul multiple trials or is that gonna, if, you, if you're in one, does that disqualify qualify you for the next one, so. 
Okay, so um, it's a very good question. So it depends on the tr uh, on the type of the trial and the type of drug that you are going to test, because you have drug that um, will have a, an ongoing effect. So even after you stop the the treatment, it's not going to uh, to wash out immediately. So this <clears throat> usually in the in the design, you are deciding beforehand that during this period of time, the the patient will not be able to participate to any other studies. But usually, it's during a, a certain time period. Um, so it's true that uh, it, it's a good question. Um, I think that it's also very important through this kind of association that uh, um, patient association that we can also discuss all together to also uh, uh, decide what is maybe the most convincing treatment at a time, of course, with the hope that it will increase and with a, a lot of different uh, new treatment available. But uh, yeah, I think uh, this, this kind of uh, what I think. <laughs> um, piggybacking on that question, I have a question about the study design as well. So instead of doing, since it's such a rare disease and I'm, I would be devastated if my son um, is on the placebo arm. I know that uh, regulators would love to see a placebo arm, but is there other, any, uh, any other way to do uh, control instead of having a placebo arm? Like, you know, I know that there are um, clinical studies comparing to the um, natural history or inpatient control. So you follow them for a while within the study and then put them on treatment uh, to see the efficacy. Uh, have you guys considered this design? Um, I guess I would ask to Melanie. Okay, thank you. I, I will answer that. I just wanted to um, to make the point that in terms of getting our an, enough patients to do a convincing clinical trial, um, the, the efforts on the part of the ACD and the physicians that are here to get more and more patients diagnosed is really, really important, and that will make it easier to demonstrate benefit in a clinical trial. So um, in terms of uh, do we have to have a placebo arm in a study, it's a very, very good question. And the thing is that we, we have to consider in our own study design whether we could design a study that would effectively show benefit without having a placebo group. But even if we are convinced that we could do that, um, for example, maybe, and, I may, and this again is not referring specifically to our study, but say we decided we wanted to have a really long run-in period so we could get an idea of how these patients do over time and then put those patients on drug and compare how they were before with how they are in the study. Um, even if we decided to do something like that, then the agency may say, no, we're not going to let you do that. You have to have a placebo-controlled study. Um, so, so that is, it's a complicated decision Obviously, we would like to give everybody the drug, but at a certain point, especially in a phase three study, they are going to want some comparator arm that is generally going to be a placebo. Just to add a comment, uh, usually when you participate in a, in a trial, you have a period of time when you are uh, double blind, so no, the, the physician nor the patient knows what you are receiving by then, but usually after the end of the trial, after the end of your participation, I don't know, let's say three months or something like that, or six months or a year, I don't know. Um, then after that, usually you can have a phase where um, all the patients that participated in the study can receive the treatment. So it's an open phase um, at yes. the end of the, of the double blind uh, control trial. Exactly, and again, that's why we, um that's why choosing the endpoints are so important because we want an endpoint that hopefully will show benefit maybe in just three months so that th that everybody who is in the placebo arm could then go into the open label extension. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Dr. Andrews. Thank oh, no. you. Just one, one quick comment. I think it, the, the trial, how you uh, mentioned, it's possible for very, very rare disorders, very aggressive therapies. For example, if we are doing a therapy into, into the brain, intracerebrovascular therapy, then the placebo is not an option. Uh, and there are clinical trials designed like that, and then the randomized clinical trial control did not work for those. That's why uh, natural history studies are the way to compare the outcomes with and without treatments. Can we get approvals from regulatory bodies after the trial is finished? It's a complex way, however we can do that. 
Thank you, Dr. Andrews. Uh, we are um, going to our last question of this session. Um, so uh, just be prepared for a session change after this. So I want to ask uh, just to switch the focus a little bit towards a GAMT trial. And um, if you have experience maybe with other very rare disorders where you have a very small patient population and you see such different phenotypes um, based on, you know, in the GAMPT community, we may have a, a two-year-old who was diagnosed and treated for the last few years and has shown good improvements and, and maybe what would be a meaningful outcome to that family and an observable outcome would be very different than the 20-year-old example and, and whatnot. And could there potentially be multiple outcomes in a trial that where you say it is age dependent or, or something like that, have caveats to provide for the very different potential outcomes that you could see in those individuals? Mm, that's an excellent idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's the way to go. I, I don't, uh, again, I don't know exactly what the regulators would, would say to that. But yes, I mean, trying to in, uh, enroll as many uh, patients as possible in the first place, but perhaps using uh, different um, outcome measures depending on s certain variables. I think that's possible, yes. Thank you. That's a, that's a great segue and a plug for GAMT community members to please get on our registry and fill out surveys over there. Got you, Emily. Just, just a, a comment. I think that uh, it's very important to understand that why are we insisting to have a lot of patients included in the clinical trials? It's because based on the number of patients that, you, yeah, that would be included in the clinical trial, you will have a, 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 what we call the power of the study, meaning that uh, you will have a better chance to really actually see the effect that you are looking for. And that's why it's very interesting because um, to answer your question, the, the SCED design, the end of one trial type of trials, are really uh, designed in order to include and to work on very rare disease with a small number of patients because then the, the power of the study depends on the number of the repetition of the measurement of the outcome measure and not so much about how many patients you include in the trials. What is also very interesting in the N of one trial is that every patient is his own control, which is very interesting when you, you would like to include a lot of patients who have very uh, different phenotypes, um, but uh, we are out of time, so. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you so much for that perspective. Um, I think that brings us to the end of our uh, panel discussion. I know that time has fallen short as always, but I hope that we'll follow through with discussions over uh, dinner and the evening session. Um, I want to thank uh, Melanie for joining us remotely, um, and I also want to thank all of our panelists here for uh, that discussion. Much appreciated.